Russia has officially stated that it will leave the International Space Station after 2024 and launch its own space station shortly thereafter. The announcement was made after Yuri Borisov, the new head of Russia's space agency, discussed the decision with President Vladimir Putin on July 26. Borisov's statement reaffirmed previous declarations by Russian space officials to leave the space station after the current international arrangements for its operation ends in 2024. The International Space Station, which has been orbiting the Earth since 1998, is co-managed by Russia, the United States, the European Union, Japan, and Canada. The current plan of NASA and other international partners is to deorbit the aging structure after 2030, sending any remnants of re-entry into a remote region of the South Pacific Ocean. Russian officials have long expressed their desire to leave the ISS, claiming that the aging orbiting outpost is compromising safety and making it difficult to extend its lifespan. If Russia abandons the station, the immediate task would be to keep it in orbit. Former Director General of Roscosmos, Dmitry Rogozin, warned that Russia's withdrawal from cooperation could result in the ISS exiting orbit in an uncontrolled manner because orbit correction is done solely by the engines of Russia's Progress cargo spacecraft. However, even if Russia abandons the station, SpaceX's Dragon capsule and Northrop Grumman Cygnus capsule are currently capable of boosting its orbit. Moreover, the International Space Station is divided into two sections, one run by Russia and the other by the United States and other countries. And it's currently unclear what would happen to the Russian side of the complex after they leave. After leaving the ISS, Roscosmos plans to build its own national space station, known as the Russian Orbital Service Station, or ROS. ROS will operate from a sun-synchronous orbit at an altitude of 372 kilometers and an inclination of 96.9 degrees. This orbit will allow Russia to observe most of its territory from space and study Earth's poles with optical, infrared, ultraviolet, radio, and other detectors. ROS will be constructed in two phases. The first phase will begin in 2028 with the launch of the science and power module, called NEM. A node module with six docking ports and a gateway module with an airlock will be launched later that year. The base module, equipped with powerful solar panels, will then arrive at the station. In the second phase, which is expected to start in 2030, a target module, a production module, and a partly pressurized service platform for the maintenance of the satellites will be added. The station will operate mostly automatically, with no human presence on board, but it may be visited if necessary. The crew will be sent to Ross only for a period of one to two months to perform commissioning and repair work, because, according to Roscosmos, the permanent presence of the crew consumes a significant amount of the station's energy, and without the crew, this energy could be used for experiments. The first crews will fly to Ross on Soyuz twice a year from Baconer, and cargo will be delivered by Progress ships. Later the crews and the cargo will be delivered using the Oriel spacecraft currently in development. Please follow the link in the description to learn more about the Russian space station. NASA is delaying the next commercial crew mission to the International Space Station by nearly a month after the Falcon 9 booster that will launch it was damaged during transport. The Crew-5 mission, previously scheduled for early September, will now launch no earlier than September 29. The Falcon 9 first stage set for the Crew-5 mission was damaged when it was transported from SpaceX's factory in Hawthorne, California, to its test facility in McGregor, Texas. X-ray inspections and load and shock analysis confirmed only a portion of the rocket's interstage was damaged and the rest of the vehicle was unharmed. According to NASA, SpaceX is currently removing and replacing the interstage and some onboard instrumentation. After all replacement hardware is installed, the booster will undergo stage testing and be evaluated further before being accepted and certified for flight. Once all rocket and spacecraft system checkouts are complete and all components are certified for flight, teams will mate Dragon to the Falcon 9 rocket and SpaceX's hangar at Launch Complex 39A. NASA astronaut Nicole Mann will command the planned six-month Crew-5 mission. She will be joined by NASA astronaut Josh Kasata, Japanese astronaut Koichi Wakata, and Russian cosmonaut Anna Kakina. The astronauts will fly to the space station in Dragon Endurance, which previously flew the agency's Crew-3 mission to and from the space station. Wen Tin, the first lab module of China's Jiangong Space Station, successfully docked with the Tianco Core module on July 24. Wen Tin was launched into orbit atop a Long March 5B rocket from the Wenchang spaceport on the southern island of Hainan on Sunday. The module, which measures 17.9 meters long, 4.2 meters wide, and weighs 22,000 kilograms, is intended to provide a pressurized environment for astronauts to conduct science experiments. The docking of Wen Tin marks the penultimate phase in the construction of China's Jiangong Space Station, which is expected to be completed by late 2022. 
Please see my previous video for more details on the Wentin module, link in the description. While the Wentin launch and docking were successful, attention will now be on the fate of the first stage of the Long March 5B rocket, which entered orbit along with Wentin. The stage is currently deorbiting in an uncontrolled manner and is expected to crash back to Earth. It's nearly impossible to predict where and when the roughly 21-ton rocket body will re-enter the atmosphere. A re-entry of a rocket stage this size will not burn up in the atmosphere, and generally, 20-40% to 40 of the object's mass will reach the ground. Normally, after stage separation, the first stage of a rocket and its strap-on boosters fall into a safe area, usually in the ocean. The problem is that the massive first stage of the Long March 5B also performs the duties of the upper stages of other rockets and so has not been dumped downrange. Instead, it entered orbit and will eventually return to Earth. Moreover, while most rockets can restart their engines in orbit and dispose of themselves in a controlled manner, this does not apply to Long March 5B. Instead, the descent will be uncontrolled as the orbit decays. The rocket body is expected to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere around 7.52 a.m. UTC on July 31, plus or minus 22 hours. When it comes to the uncontrolled re-entry of rocket stages, this is not China's first rodeo. Debris from two previous Long March 5B launches also fell back to Earth in 2020 and 2021. NASA and the European Space Agency have revised their plans for the Mars Sample Return Mission. NASA's Perseverance rover, which landed on the Red Planet in 2021, is currently collecting and caching samples on Mars. The ambitious Mars Sample Return mission entails retrieving approximately 30 sample tubes cached by the rover. To retrieve the cached samples, NASA and ESA plan to launch a sample retrieval lander mission to Mars in July 2026. The lander, which will land on the Martian surface in August 2028, was designed to carry and deploy a sample fetch rover to collect samples left on the surface by Perseverance. After collecting the sample tubes, the rover will return them to the lander platform and load them into the Mars Ascent vehicle. This vehicle will perform the first liftoff from Mars and deploy the container into Mars orbit. ESA's Earth Return Orbiter, scheduled to launch in September 2026, will rendezvous with and capture the basketball-sized sample container orbiting Mars. The samples will be sealed in a biocontainment system, and the spacecraft will return to Earth in 2031. The capsule containing the samples is expected to arrive on Earth in 2033. On July 27, NASA officials announced that they plan to redesign the mission, abandoning the sample fetch rover. NASA's Perseverance rover, which is expected to be active when the Mars sample return lander lands in 2028, will now be tasked with transporting the samples it collects and caching them to the Mars Ascent vehicle. The sample retrieval lander will carry two sample recovery helicopters. And if Perseverance fails, the helicopters will be available as backup options to pick up the caches themselves. The helicopters will be similar to Ingenuity in size and mass, but they will have mobility wheels on their landing legs to traverse across the surface. A mini robotic arm on each of the craft will allow the drones to pick up the sample tubes Perseverance leaves behind. If Perseverance's health remains stable over the next eight years, and it does not require assistance in returning samples to the lander, the choppers could observe and photograph the process. Once the samples arrive on Earth, scientists plan to perform detailed chemical and physical analyses in laboratories to look for signs of past life on Mars, as well as a variety of other studies that go beyond the capabilities of instruments delivered to Mars. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After completing five back-to-back -back spin prime tests, Starship 24 is now ready for the static fire test campaign. Teams are currently readying the launch site and the ship for the upcoming tests. To avoid damage during the tests, teams recently cleared ground support equipment from the vicinity of suborbital launch pad B. The SpaceX crane stationed near pad B was moved closer to the orbital launch mount on June 26. Teams were also seen working on Ship 24's Raptor engines, probably performing final checks on all six engines. As per the road closure notice, Ship 24's static fire tests will begin as early as Monday, August 1. SpaceX may conduct pre-burner tests of the engines before moving on to static fire tests. Static fire tests might begin by firing one or two Raptors and then progress to a full six-engine test. Meanwhile, at the build site, teams continue to remove Raptor engines from Booster 7 for inspections following the July 11th anomaly. So far, teams have removed more than a dozen engines from the booster, and several of them were sent to SpaceX's McGregor rocket development facility for repairs. A few of the removed engines were replaced with new engines last week. Several brand new engines were also delivered to Starbase for installation. It's currently unclear how long it will take to install these new engines on Booster 7. 
Only after installing all those engines and conducting a final checkout will SpaceX be able to roll out Booster 7 to the launch site for static fire testing. There is a slim chance that SpaceX may roll out Booster 8 to the launch site to begin cryo-proof tests, while Booster 7 is being repaired inside the wide bay. Once Booster 8 has completed cryo-testing, teams can bring the prototype back to the build site for engine installation. At the same time, Booster 7 with all engines installed can be transported to the launch site to resume ground testing. Teams continue to inspect and repair the orbital launch mount in preparation for the next super heavy testing cycle. Although the launch mount has survived the anomaly without any significant visible damage, there may have been some minor damage to the structure that needed to be repaired. The rocket catching and stacking arm upgrade works are continuing. Teams have begun installing the hydraulic actuators that will act as shock absorbers during a rocket catch attempt. A total of 10 such actuators are required to safely catch starships and super heavies from mid-air. While preparing Ship 24 and Booster 7 for testing, SpaceX is also conducting structural tests on a test tank labeled Booster 7.1. SpaceX designed this test tank specifically to test the latest Super Heavy design changes, and structural tests were performed on it to simulate the forces that a Super Heavy booster will encounter during flight. During such a structural stress test on July 21, the tank buckled due to high internal pressure. Following the anomaly, on July 25, teams removed the cap of the test stand from the tank with the help of a crane. The cap was designed to squeeze and apply stress on the test tank while it is being filled with subcooled nitrogen. The following day, teams installed a vent stack on top of the test tank. This apparatus is designed to vent gases through an opening to regulate pressure inside the tank. The very next day after installing the vent stack, the test tank was subjected to a cryoproof test. Throughout the test, the vent stack valves were opened and closed at regular intervals to build up and release pressure inside the tank. The entire test lasted about five hours before the tank was fully drained. On Friday morning, the test tank was lifted from the test stand and placed on a transporter stand for transport back to the construction site. This marks the end of the Booster 7.1 test tank tests, and we can assume that SpaceX has gathered all of the necessary data. Work on the Starship launch tower and launch pad at Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A is moving quickly. On Wednesday evening, the fifth section of the orbital launch tower was transported from SpaceX's operations area at Roberts Road to Pad 39A. Hours later, a crane lifted the fifth section and stacked it on top of the fourth section of the tower. Four more sections are required to complete the 146-meter-tall orbital launch tower. The fifth section will house the Starship's quick disconnect arm, which will facilitate loading propellants into the Starship. The QD arm is currently being prefabricated at Roberts Road. Next to the QD arm is the rocket catching and stacking arm, the arm is shorter than the arm installed at Starbase. NASA officials in recent months have told SpaceX that a Starship explosion at Pad 39A could put at risk nearby launch infrastructure and effectively cut off the agency's sole means of launching astronauts to the International Space Station. The short tower arms being built at Roberts Road would most likely be only capable to stack starships, and they won't be able to catch rockets from mid-air. So it appears that SpaceX is only planning to launch starships from Pad 39A and not catch them, because catching a rocket is more likely to fail than launching it. SpaceX is planning to construct another starship launch tower at Kennedy Space Center, and this tower might be used to catch super-heavy boosters that will be launched from Pad 39A. The exact location of Kennedy's second Starship launch tower is currently unknown. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.